We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Hey, everybody, this is John Odermatt, your host of Finding Freedom. And real quick, before we get started with today's show, I want to tell you about a, uh, a new enhancement to the Lions of Liberty Pride. Um, for my interviews, I am now going to be having a, a bonus um, Pride-only segment to every interview I do that's going to be about 10 to 15 minutes of, of bonus content. You'll be able to hear it if you join the Lions of Liberty Pride at any level. So, for example, today's interview with uh, with Steve Arena, the founder of Masa Chips. Um, you'll have a bonus, about 12 minutes uh, talking with Steve. I'm digging in deeper to the topics we talked about during the show today. So if you want to hear the rest of today's interview, be sure to join the Lions of Liberty Pride at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty or at lionsofliberty.locals.com. Hope you enjoy today's show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Finding Freedom right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And super excited for today's episode um, for you guys to get to talk to the founder of a revolutionary tortilla chip company. And I don't say that lightly. I really don't say that lightly. This is an interview um, that uh, you know I've, I've wanted to uh, to track down and talk to this guy since I came across his product several months ago. And uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to, to get into it and for you guys to hear his story and to really learn about um, what it takes in order to uh, to disrupt a, uh, a snack food market. Really interesting stuff. And we'll get to that in a minute. Before I do that, the chips that we're talking about are Masa Chips. It's a new brand, and we're going to be talking to the founder. So it's Masa Chips, M-A-S-A. And we got a, a discount here. We got a discount code uh, through Lions of Liberty. You can get 10% off of your purchase of Masa Chips. These are tortilla, tortilla chips fried in grass-fed beef tallow. So no seed oils. I've been looking for a chip like this my whole life. I mean, and it, it doesn't exist, which is why this is just so incredible um, that Stephen, uh, my guest today, has come up and really put in the work to uh, to make this come true. So in order to get your Masa chips for 10% off, uh, you can go to masachips.com slash lions, or just when you're checking out, if you go to masachips.com, just make sure to put in promo code Lions, and you'll get 10% off your order. Now, this is a startup, guys. I want to just reinforce that this is a startup. He's starting this up from nothing. Uh, he'll talk about the process, how they're making these chips. They're doing it by hand. So they are a little bit more expensive. But what you're doing is you're investing in someone who is disrupting a major market um, that has really been just uh, held hostage by these major mega food corporations who've been filling us up with uh, disgusting seed oils and other processed garbage. So support someone who is doing the right thing and making change. Go to masachips.com and enter promo code LIONS for 10% off. And with that, let's get into today's interview. Cool. All right. So here we are, live to the Lions of Liberty Pride. I am joined by Stephen Arena, a.k.a. A really tan man. If you're watching live on video, you can see it's his handle there. Um, it's also his handle on, on Twitter, uh, I believe. But Correct. where I found Steve, and uh, it, other than his uh, his tweets and uh, some of his really epic tweet threads, is I came across a really unique tortilla chip that is not fried in any seed oils. It's actually fried in uh, grass-fed beef tallow. And we're going to talk about that. But this was several months ago when I found this and it totally blew my mind. It's something that I've been looking for, um, for, for years. So really cool, 
um, that Steve is doing that with uh, with his company, which we'll talk about. Um, he's right. also, you might have guessed, an anti-seed oil activist. He's an alternative health activist. He's the founder of the Shire app, which help to, helps to connect people with uh, local farmers to get uh, get food close to your home. So, Stephen, welcome to Find Your Freedom, man. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me on here. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, good to uh, good to connect with you. And you know, before we get you know talking about everything you're working on, really, uh, you're, you're revolutionizing the uh, tortilla chip market, which is incredible. Um, before we get into that, I just want to know, like, what, what's your background, man? I mean, if you follow you on Twitter, you can see that you know you're you're talking about raw milk. You're talking about um, you know the importance of sunlight. You're talking about all all these, you know, natural health things. I'm just curious, you know, what, what led you up to this? Where did you start and how did you, how did you get to here? Sure. So yeah, when I was in college, uh, well, I guess a, a bit of, a bit before that, when I was a kid, I was never like the healthiest person. Um, for example, back in the day, I think it was in eighth grade when the swine flu was a thing and I like got swine flu. And then like two weeks later, I got the normal flu. And, you know, I would, I would have these sort of like allergies, like congested and other, I would get sick a lot. Um, so I was never the healthiest person. I mean, never anything debil that debilitating, but when I got to college, um, like that kind of continued. And so like, as it, as it just happened, I was studying abroad in Belgium one summer and like over there, they don't have the whole dormitories where the dining hall cooks for you and everything is like, you know, done for you. And so I basically had to cook for myself. And that was the first time in my life I ever had to feed myself. Um, and one of the first things being a naturally curious person as like, after I started looking into like, okay, what should I cook or, or how to cook it, the question that became like, okay, what should I cook? Um, and I started reading about like different diets and dietary philosophies. And I, I experimented a few things on myself. Notably, I started eating like paleo, which was all the rage back then. Um, and I noticed I felt better. Like I had been congested, for example, for basically my entire life at that, up until that point. Mm -hmm. Um, never being able to go very far from a box of tissues. And I noticed within a few weeks of like eating better um, and eating foods that I cooked for myself that like that went away. And that alone was like life changing. Cause like at that point, and I think mo like most people have this attitude where like they're sort of resigned to like their circumstances, whether it's their financial circumstances or their health circumstances or their physical circumstances or social circumstances, people kind of just accept it. They think that's what's, what's normal because that's what they know. And so for me, I had just accepted that like I would always be congested and like I'm a person who needs tissues and I'm a person who gets sick a lot. Um, so this experience kind of taught me that like that's not entirely true. Like you can change your circumstances. And so, you know, obviously it started with health and then like continued on to other things. Um, but that uh, from there, I kind of started going down the rabbit hole and it's been, I think, eight years since that time. And I've just continued to learn a lot more. Um, and ultimately, I think about a year and a half ago is when I first started actually like posting about this stuff like online. Uh, I started with like TikTok and then Instagram and then Twitter, which I guess is how you find me or you found me on Instagram. I'm not sure. But yeah, so over the past year yeah. and a half, I started I started posting about it. And then, you know, here we are. So so where does the uh, where's the name really Tan Man come from? Um, so I it's a great question. Uh, I think it's just because I'm really tan and I think. Uh, I'm like, like my grandparents are all like Southern Italian. And so like, naturally we have the whole olive skin thing going on, but I really believe in like the power of sunlight as like one of the things that can make you a lot healthier. And so I think it was like a natural and like very catchy sort of name that I think my friend, uh, helped me come up with. We were both like, we challenged each other to like make a TikTok every single day for like two months. Um, and so he already had one. And so he like helped me kind of come up with the name. And once I heard it, I was like, oh, you know, that's good. That's great. I, <laughs> I can get behind this. That's catchy. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where we get that from. Yeah, that's, that's good branding. I mean, honestly, you, you look at like the, these brands that take off. I mean, something like a name like really tan man or you have like. On the other side, you have the, the liver king and his, his same content. Yeah. But these, these brands like actually. that, when you attach like a distinct label to it. It, it seems mm -hmm. like that's that's what works in this uh, this environment. Yeah, you have so, to you have to pick something. Yeah, you have to pick a thing. Like even if like, and I think a problem like myself included, like that a lot of people have is that like, and it, it's very difficult. But like, 
oh, my thing is all encompassing, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't just talk about sunlight and tanning. I'll talk about seed oils or raw mm-hmm. milk or meat or whatever the, the types of working out that I, whatever it is, like you have all these, like all these different attributes, you know, that like you could be associated with. Um, but one of the things that's like a very important, like branding rule is like, you really have to like pick a thing and niche down and like get specific. And like the more that succeeds, like it doesn't actually like counterintuitively, it doesn't limit you. Right. Like most of the content I produce is nothing to do with, with sunlight or tanning, but like the name like stuck and it works just like liver King. Most of his content is not, well, not, maybe not most of it, but a lot of it does not explicitly like show him eating like only liver, you know? Um, but it works because it's like mm-hmm. something that people can kind of attach onto. So let's just get right into talking about um, masa chips. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating or joking when I'm saying like, but my wife and I were, you know, we're big fans of like my wife will make fresh salsa and, you know, we love to have chips and salsa, chips and queso, all this stuff. And, you know, we've tried all these, all these different kinds of chips and they always sneak in some element of like seed oil in some way or yeah. something that, that, that makes them unhealthy. It's like, it seemed like it was impossible to make. Yeah. So yeah. Great point. Like, it's funny people like, if you tell people like, Hey, I'm going to go start a new tortilla chip. They're like, like they get confused. Like why? Right. There's a million tortilla chips, like whether you're in Publix or ShopRite or uh, Kroger or Whole Foods or Erewhon or whatever, there's a million different tortilla chips. It's like, like you would think that all the possible options for tortilla chip that could exist are on the market, which is like crazy. Mm. It's like this illusion of choice, right? But they're all the same. That's like what it really comes down to. You know, they may say some things here and there like, oh, this is organic, right? Or like made with organic corn. That's a fun one. Made in organic corn and fried in toxic seed oils. Or even better yet, Completely 100% organic, you know, organic canola oil. Isn't that, isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. Like, don't we love our organic canola oil, you know? Um, So like, they're all the same, right? And so one of my, my, my issue was basically like similar situation to you, like corn chips are amazing. Like they are delicious. They're crunchy. They're salty. They're like satisfying. You can put dips on them. You can put cheese on them. Like you can, you can snack on them. You can make a meal out of them. Um, And so like the fact that you can't eat any of them because all of them in the store are completely full of seed oils is like kind of a shame. Um, and so I think like how we got started was like we were all uh, me and me and some friends were hanging out in New Year's uh, for New Year's in like South Florida last year. It's like a, a year and a month ago. Um, and I think someone ordered tacos and they started eating them. And I was like, of course, being a seed oil denier, I like didn't have any. And then, you know, whenever, whenever you're the healthy one, people are always like giving you shit for it because they're like, oh, yeah. you know, like what you, you, I'd rather be, have fun and enjoy my life. Like your life is boring, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I have nothing against chips. Chips are great. As I've already said, I just have a problem with crappy chips. And it just so happens to be the case that all the chips are crappy, um, and then I went on this whole like rant about how you could make them in a way that wasn't bad and blah, blah, blah. And then ultimately uh, someone said like, well, why don't you go make them? And then now like that's my co-founder and here we are uh, 13 months later with, you know, chips and you found me and then now we're having this conversation. Dude, that's, that's so wild. So um, let's, let's like kind of dig in how that happened. Cause that happens all the time. If people are out drinking, someone has a great idea and uh, like, why don't you do it? And then, 99.9% of the time it doesn't happen. So well, right. why, why did it happen this time? Do you think, why, why did you follow through? Yeah. Well, so I, um, at the time I still had my like primary day job, which was like as a software engineer for a big tech company. And, um, I, for, for the very, for a very long time, I had been trying to exit into health entrepreneurship. Um, even before I got super into health, I was like very intrigued by starting, some kind of business on my own anyway, health related or not. Um, like when I was a kid, like when I was 12, I was like modifying Nerf guns and like selling them on the internet, you know, cause they shot farther than like the ones that you buy in the store. Um, or what else did I do? Yeah. I think that's, that's the primary entrepreneurial thing that I, I used to do when I was a kid. Um, and then when I was in college, me and my friends would like come up with like app ideas, like try to make something and like see if we could like get people to use and whatnot. And all of these things ultimately like never really panned out in a sort of serious sense. 
Um, but for a very long time, I like knew that like, this is sort of my calling here. It's like, I've been obsessed with like health and food and nutrition for like eight years and counting. It's probably like the longest obsession I've had, you know, in my life. So I'm like, I knew I have to do something with it. And, um, and I was in a position to do it right. My job did not require a lot of time of me. Um, and so we, we just kept at it. We kept like over the course of a few months after new year's, we like hired, like paid some friend of a friend who's like a food startup consultant to like teach us some things about the industry. Cause like none of us knew anything about it. Um, and so that like didn't really work out because we figured out that no one is no factory is really equipped to make tallow fried tortilla chips. Um, which is mm -hmm. in part one of the reasons why like these things aren't common. Um, so we learned that, you know, we, we got another friend of a friend who does package and branding design. And so we like roped him into like making the, uh, uh, making the, the package that, you know, is, is quite well known in certain circles at, at this point. Um, and as we kept going further and further, it like kept getting more and more exciting, you know, as we like would see the progress, mm -hmm. like, okay, we have a package, we have a name, we have a logo, like it's, and it looks really good. And so it was like kind of encouraging just because of how exciting, um, it was. And then ultimately when we found out we couldn't find a factory to make it for us, I was just like, all right, screw it. I'm going to, I'll do it. You know, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it ourselves. And so I bought like a turkey fryer and like a bunch of organic tortillas and some tallow and like set up this fryer on like my parents deck at like Easter last year. Um, and while everyone was like busy doing Easter things and like having brunch or whatever, I was like outside in the cold, like frying tortilla chips um, wow. and then I brought them in to my family after dinner or whatever. Everyone was like sitting there and then like, we all tried them and they like, liked them. And like my family is pretty health conscious, but they're not as like, I think as extreme as me, especially my extended family and they liked them. Right. So now, now we have mm -hmm. this thing where it's like, it's not just about the health. Like they taste really good. Um, and then yeah. those first prototypes like blew me away. And so once I tried them, cause like, to be honest, before I made them, I had never had tallow fried tortilla chips before. Um, and so when I tried them, I was like, okay, this is, this is real. Right. Because no, had no anyone, health... you think anyone had ever had a fried tortilla chip before? Honestly, no, them? no one alive yeah. in America has had a tallow yeah. fried tortilla chip before Masa. Um, I, I know of, we've gotten some comments on Instagram, for example, from like followers who are from Mexico and they're like, oh yeah, my grandma used to like make these in lard or something like that. Um, yeah. like these are so cool. Like, it's just like how she used to do it. Um, but no, I, I think exceedingly few people have ever even have ever tried a tallow fried corn chip. And so the thing that really excited me is that like most health foods, as I'm sure you're aware, having tried all the healthy chips on the, on the market, mm -hmm. most health foods are either actually not really healthy or they taste mm -hmm. like crap or both, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like <laughs> they have like chia seeds and quinoa and like God knows, mm -hmm. you know, avocado oil, which like is fake anyway. And so they, they don't taste good. And so it's like, well, what are we even doing here? And that's why, like, I think most health products don't succeed is because like only a small percentage of the total population is ever going to sacrifice taste for like the abstract concept of health. Um, taste you can feel, health you can't because most people prioritize like what's immediately in their present experience. They don't prioritize like health when it comes at that cost. So once we mm -hmm. figured out that they taste really good, then I was like, okay, this has to happen. And then from there, we like went and found a local kitchen, got started, printed up the bags. And then like at this point, we've expanded to a much larger, but apparently not a lot, not large enough facility um, where we're, where we're still making them by hand. Um, but, you know, we'll have to keep growing from there. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the tricky part, right? Cause I mean, your, your name is, is seriously getting up there now. And I mean, you have to be careful that you don't grow too fast, right? Almost. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, it's like, you know, everyone's, it's like the good problem that you want to have, uh, or it's a good problem to have. Um, and this is true, like, especially because, I don't know if anyone, like, is trying to start a CPG business or something, but if you're in retail stores and then you mm -hmm. go out of stock, like, that really screws you. Because once you, like, make a name for yourself as, like, an unreliable supplier then like, even if you end up getting back in stock six months later, no one wants to carry you anymore. Cause they're like, okay, when's the next time he's going to go out of stock. Um, fortunately, like we have a bit more flexibility in the D2C space um, because 
like if we go out of stock for two weeks, like our customers will, most of them will return two weeks later or three months later or whatever it is. Um, so that's a bit more flexibility, but yeah, we, we're, we're very much like avoiding uh, systematic, like national retail expansion until uh, we have the capacity to supply it. Right. That's smart. Yeah. Um, it, and it's so interesting. It, I mean, it, and, and I'm sure like th- there could be so much learned, so many insights in building, building up a brand from, uh, from nothing. But I, I'm just curious, like, when you look back on you know the craziness of, of the past year or, or mm-hmm. whatever it's been, is there anything that you would have done differently if you could do it again? Um, honestly, like, I guess, I, I mean, I know a bit more about marketing now. So there are some things that I would have done back then to like make us grow even quicker. Um, mm-hmm. But like nothing I would say that was like a fatal error, um, in like a really, like a really real sense. I mean, I think it's important to hire the right people. That's probably true. Um, like be very, um, I'm not going to say like cautious, but like really, I think know the people that you're going to be working with or hiring for whatever reason. Um, and like have options in, in, you know, in regard to that. Um, because you're going to be like, you're going to need to trust them. You're going to need to work with them for a while. They're going to need to do what you need them to do and whatever else. Um, but in terms of doing anything wrong, like in a serious way, honestly, like we're pretty blessed, but I think it all, it all went quite, quite smoothly. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Really? Such yeah. A, I, th- I think such a big venture. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with market timing, right? Like seed oils are a thing. They're a big thing. The, and mm-hmm. like that movement has legs um, and it hasn't really been capitalized on by brands yet. Like every other, br- every other trend has been de- dealt with, right? You want gluten-free, there's a whole aisle for gluten-free. You want keto, there's a whole aisle for keto. You want a little paleo sticker, there's a whole aisle for paleo stickers. You want an organic sticker, you can find everything mm-hmm. with an organic sticker. But if you want things without seed oils, there's really no alternative. But there's a lot of people who want that alternative. Um, I think that's in part due to the fact that it's actually pretty difficult to make things without seed oils. Um, so brands don't do it. Like they'll take, you know, they can make something keto easy, just, you know, add even more fake ingredients. Um, they can Mm -hmm. make things organic easy, just import organic ingredients from China where like, they're not actually certified by like us certifying agencies. And now you have organic, right? Yeah. Gluten-free, same thing. Just get some more. Honestly, these trends benefit food companies because they end up allowing food companies to like profit from what would otherwise be like considered waste material, you know, like even going back a hundred years, like the fiber trend, like, right. Like, like bran flake, Kellogg's bran flakes or whatever, like wheat bran, which like for people that don't know is like the outside part of like the kernel of wheat um, that like gets removed when you turn it into white flour. At that time, white flour was all the rage. And so wheat bran was garbage, literal garbage. Like no one wanted it. And so Kellogg's came around and figured out a way to sell what would otherwise be garbage. Um, and you'll notice that most of these food trends uh, from then on have been in either finding ways to sell what's actual garbage or of course, finding ways to just like sell things that would otherwise not have been eaten, but like could be more easily pr- mass produced than the things that they're replacing. Um, and so that's yeah. why seed oils is going to be tough for, bre- for companies to follow because it's, it's, it's pretty hard to do con- relative to like where the industry is right now. Yeah. And I, I think it could be wrong, but I mean, the theory around this, this, this kind of informed by, you know, hearing from people in the industry, um, I remember hearing an interview with, uh, Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Bailu. Is that my saying his name right? Guy who was founder uh, for Quest, you know the Quest bars and that stuff, which I, ha- mm-hmm. I have a lot of problems with the ingredients in uh, in the Quest stuff. But in that interview, he was saying that like in order to make those bars, like they couldn't even do it um, with the ingredients they wanted to use, which were mm-hmm. a, a little bit healthier than the, what, what was be used, be used at the time because they, they weren't able to, to form it into bars or didn't have you know, yeah. or whatever. And I, I have a theory that like a lot of these protein bars or bars or whatever, um, the reason they have seed oils is just to get it through the equipment really. 
Um, yeah, probably. It, it makes it more of a, uh, you know, um, a process that can be ramped up. And it, it's, it's not even for um, any purpose other than that, really. Yeah, well, it's there's crazy. another, I think there's another one that you, you might find interesting, which is that like there's an active like incentive to not use animal based ingredients um, in food processing plants due to mm. a number of factors, mostly of a regulatory nature. Um, so like if, if you have certain certifications from various governmental agencies and, and others for running a food processing plant, whenever there's meat involved, it's a lot harder. Like the USDA makes it harder. Hmm. Um, other sort of certifications make it more difficult. And because like, even though you have the equipment to do it, right, they have the equipment to make stuff in tallow. It's not a big problem. However, if like that ingredient touches your equipment, then, you know, in order to like get it, you're going to need to get it cleaned and then recertified after you make the run of whatever that product is, that adds a lot of cost to the operation. And so it, it strongly disincentivizes people from using animal based ingredients. Um, so that's, that's another one why I think seed oils end up in a lot of foods because they just, they're from plants. They conform like everyone, all regulatory and other, you know, just public health sentiment in general is like me is scary bacteria. It goes bad. We need to regulate. We need to inspect. We need to clean. We need to have people with clipboards checking boxes and whatever. So because of all that added expense of regulation, uh, people would rather just not use it. And seed oils are like a pretty good, like, well, at least economically speaking, a pretty good a answer to that question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy but I mean, I'm in total agreement that, I mean, the financial incentives are there for the shift to be made to give people what they want. And I think it's only going to get bigger and bigger with people, you know, just not accepting food. food with seed and I mean, a lot of it is, is manifesting in people just cooking themselves, which is, which is awesome. It's great. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, people do need to be able to pick up healthy options quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, in the world we live in. Right. So, like if, if, if healthy um, food is not yeah. easy food, if it, if like the healthy food is not easy to find or get or buy or cook yeah. or eat or whatever, then people aren't going to be healthy. It's as simple as that. Like, yeah, you'll have 5% yeah. of people who like will try really hard and go and spend money and go and spend time and go to this store for this thing and that store for that thing and buy moss chips online from here and this other brand online from there. So there's going to be some percentage of the people that will do that. But most people, in order to be healthy, you need to make it just as easy to be healthy as it is for them to be unhealthy. Um, and right now, that's not where we're at, but yeah. I think that's where we're headed. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I want to shift a little bit and talk about raw milk. Um, cool. You had a post, I think it was, uh, I think I saw it on Twitter, but I think you had it on Instagram as well. It's really talking about the history of raw milk, and it, it, it totally opened my eyes. I'm not because I hadn't heard of like, the benefits of raw milk before, but I'd never like learned this. Year. Like uh, when you go to grade school and you, you know, I went to public schools. Up, you, you learn about uh, Louis Pasteur and, you know, this mm. is the guy that, um, you know, position and he's, he's saved so many lives by making this product clean and healthy. So it, it can be mass produced and we can all get our milk that's mm -hmm. filled with vitamins that makes us strong, gives us strong bones and all this stuff. Um, but I didn't realize like the simple history and the way you explained it, I'll let you explain it again. Basically what happened and why raw milk went away mm -hmm. and why we have the milk. Yeah. Days. That, takes that, uh, that post you did. Yeah. Louis Pasteur. What a hero, right? Like, Oh, it saved millions of people from dying of, from milk. Okay. Well, what happened like throughout all of human history when people were drinking, what happened during the ice age when people were drinking milk? Like, what's happened in like medieval Europe and like Western India and like the mm -hmm. Middle East for literally 15,000 years, right? Were they all dying from raw milk? Of course not. But no one ever asked that question, right? Mm -hmm. They like the, the, the framing for most people in their view of like modernity is like there's a now that's like glorious, and good and technology and industry enabled. And then there's like the bad dark ages where everyone was like sick and unhealthy which is like Britain circa 1820, right? That's what they compare. They compare now to Britain in 1820. So like whenever people say the past, that's literally what they mean, which is crazy because that's like a very small segment of the past, right? Whenever you say the past, mm -hmm. you should specify both where and when you're talking about. And while there's a lot of similarities across different places and times in the past, there's also a lot of differences. Um, 
And so that's the thing that people always ignore. So like, yeah, from a bacteria, whatever standpoint, pasteurization, this and that. Yeah, there are fewer people dying from mil milk induced illness or foodborne illness, like at least acute foodborne illness today than there were during the early industrial revolution and into the 1900s. Like that's certainly true, but like better does not mean best, you know? And so just because mm -hmm. we have fewer people dying from bacteria in milk now does not mean we have the best possible milk situation. Um, so to get, so basically so what happened was that when, uh, you know, for all of history, people kept their cows out in the fields, right? Where they lived in rural areas, farming 95% of all people who lived throughout all of history were basically farmers, or at least, you know, history since antiquity. Um, and they kept their cows there and they drank the milk and everything was good. Well, the issue happened when people started moving into cities in like the mid 1800s um, for to work in factories because factories, you know, industrial revolution made factory work a thing when it previously hadn't been. And so mm -hmm. well, what do you do for milk when you're moving into a city? Well, do you bring your cows with you? Do you leave them at home, like out in the countryside? You can't leave them out in the countryside because refrigeration doesn't exist yet and the automobile doesn't exist yet. And so mm -hmm. milk can't get produced and then distributed and then drunk quick enough before it goes bad when it's not refrigerated. So the only answer if you want milk is to bring the cows with you. And if you know anything about cows, you'll know that they are not like city life is not fit place for cows to exist. Right. right. Why are there no cows walking around in Central Park? Right. Cows are not meant for cities. Although actually, maybe we should have some cows in Central Park, whatever. They're not walking around in like Soho yeah. or something. Um, so the issue was that they would build these like warehouses in the outskirts of cities, notably in the, in Brooklyn, um, in the New York context, and they would feed the cows. Well, what, what would you feed the cows? Right. If you had a cows in a warehouse in Brooklyn, well, cows eat grass. There's no grass. The waste, the waste from the, uh, from the liquor process, right? Yes, exactly. They were fed whatever, mm -hmm. whatever remotely edible material that these people could get their hands on. And so whiskey distillation was a thing in Brooklyn. And so like the byproducts of whiskey distillation were pumped into the cows. Um, like I, I've, I've seen in some instances where people were feeding them like literal garbage, um, like trash. Right. And while mm -hmm. pigs are meant or pigs are able to eat trash. This is pretty cool. A thing about pigs cow, like at least not like plastic, but like, you know, human waste, animal waste, <laughs> decomposing food, bad food, rotten food, whiskey, mash, whatever, whatever you want, pigs will eat. Um, Cows do not work that way. <laughs> and so because they were feeding the cows trash, the milk became toxic. Bacteria would like grow and fester. Um, I was reading about how they would have to add like bleach or like white flour into the milk to like make it look white again because it like wasn't white and all this stuff. Wow. And so a lot, of, a lot of babies died and it was like this big scandal. Um, and so the solution, of course, to this problem uh, is not to actually restore the cows to their proper habitat and proper diet. Of course not. That would be too expensive or too difficult or whatever. So it just so happened that pasteurization, uh, Louis Pasteur like got his hands on this project, realized that if you boiled the milk, you'd kill the bacteria and the bacteria were the things that were causing the acute illness. And so after you feed boiled milk to kids, they wouldn't just drop dead instantly. Um, of course, this doesn't do anything to the quality of the milk. It doesn't make it more nutrient dense. It doesn't get rid of like other unhealthy additives that found their way in through this process. It just kills the bacteria, which are responsible for like acute death. And if you know anything about how like liability well, works. Well, it, kill, it kills, yeah. kills all the bacteria, right? It kills all, all the, the good, bacteria. good bacteria too. Yeah, Good bacteria, yeah. bad bacteria, whatever you want. Yeah. And like the thing yeah. about liability um, is that liability is only, like it only matters what can be proven in court. So causality must be like very like narrow to prove liability. So like, as long as the milk is not killing people instantly, hey, they're innocent. Even if it like caused developmental disabilities because the kids weren't getting the nutrients they needed, even mm -hmm. if they developed cancer, whatever else, diabetes, who knows what. As long as those things happen on a long enough time scale, companies are not liable because you can't really prove that very easily in court. So that solved their kind problem. Of, kind of reminds me of, of recent uh, pharmaceutical but I, I'll leave that out there. I'll just leave that out there. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's there's a lot of a lot of examples of this throughout history, um, mm -hmm. and so the anyway, the point is the milk was dead, right? Nutrient devoid, uh, was not high quality, 
problem wasn't really solved, but pasteurization worked uh, for the time being. Um, of course, now that you have this like legally mandated thing, like a government supported monopoly, like crops up around it, the pasteurization houses of which there are very few that are registered to do business in each state. Um, they end up like all the milk that gets produced in that state ends up going through those pasteurization facilities. So you can imagine how profitable that is for the people that own those. Um, so they don't want to give up their toehold on pasteurization. And by the time that you could actually solve this problem, which is when refrigeration was invented and you could put the milk back out in the countryside where it belongs and ship it into the cities in refrigerated containers, by the time that solution was available, the pasteurization industrial complex was already ingrained um, and it hasn't really gone away so easily. I mean, the U.S. is is honest is pretty progressive when it comes to this. Um, but like Canada, Australia, like no, like the the pasteurization industrial complex is like very strong uh, in those places and and yeah. still in some U.S. states. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's kind of state by state. I'm in I'm in Pennsylvania, and it's oh, nice. I mean, you, you you can get raw milk here, um, but it's I mean. It's not easy. And the, the place, the place closest to me where, where I can get it, they actually just had a, an FDA test that they, that they failed. They found a pathogen or something. The milk's fine, uh, but it did shut down for like two weeks, but uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. There is another way to do it, which I want to look into where essentially you like go in with other people and like share a cow. So mm -hmm. the cow is then owned by, you know, a group of people. So mm -hmm. it's not regulated the same way. Same um, thing with meat. You can do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause you, you can't, um, you can't sell meat to like a retail customer that hasn't been processed in the USDA certified facility. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you own the cow, you can bring it to what's uh, get what's called custom butchery, uh, or custom, a, a custom slaughterhouse. Okay. And they, if you own the cow, they can slaughter it and, you know, package it for you, but it's illegal to sell it. But if you own the cow with like three or four, however many other people, then yeah, that's fine. That works. Yeah. Crazy. So that kind of leads us right into the next topic. Last topic here before we get into uh, the bonus show in, uh, in about five minutes. Um, talking about the the Shire app. Am, am I saying sure. right? Shire? Shire. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, um, so w when when did you start that? So I started that. Um, I believe I had the, the website first live last November. So like 13 months ago. Um, but I, I had been like, I've been working on it tangibly for a few months prior to that. And I had been scheming to make something like it for, you mm -hmm. know, a year, multiple years before that. Um, point is people will always ask me like, okay, where do I get, you, you know, Steven, you have raw milk and you get pasteurized eggs and you get grass fed beef liver and you get, you know, raw sour cream and all these things. Like, how do I get this stuff? Um, and I'm like obsessive about looking for farms and finding farms wherever I go. And so if it's at home, I know where all the spots are. If I'm traveling, I spend time to do the research to figure out where the farms are so that I can like mm -hmm. buy the right food when I'm there. Um, but like most people don't have the time or wherewithal or interest in like doing all that due diligence like ahead of time. So if you want to find food from like local farms and it's not as if it's not available, it is. You just have to like know where to look. And the status quo is that that process is very difficult. Um, so the point of Shire was it is to just make like a very easily searchable database of all the places where you can get like quote unquote good food like near you. Mm -hmm. um, whether there's like local little health food stores that like meet the quality criteria that we have, or if it's small farms, or if it's like sort of food buying clubs, um, whatever it is. Like on Shire, if you put in your location, you'll be able to find uh, at least all the locations that we have indexed good food like near you. Um, so the goal is of course, better accuracy and better complete completeness of that data set. Um, and then, you know, there's plenty of places to take it from there, but, but yeah, the main problem is that like people need to find good food from local farms. It's hard to do that because farmers mm -hmm. like don't have an updated website. They're not good at marketing. They don't spend time on it, whatever. And this allows them to find those sources. <clears throat> have you, uh, connected with people from the beef initiative? Are you familiar with that? Oh, uh, I've seen them on Twitter. I don't think I've talked yeah. to them at all. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. just, I'm just like-minded people would be a good connect yeah. probably to make. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know them personally. Um, 
I think is that Bitcoin and beef or is that someone else on Twitter? No, that yeah, that's Bitcoin and beef. I mean, you don't have okay. to you, you don't have to use Bitcoin, but yeah, they they, they sure. promote yeah using Bitcoin to buy from a, a local rancher. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, that's like a great. I mean, that's a great form of value exchange, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you right, because this is kind of the whole point. If you're buying from a farmer, like that's a direct purchase. You're cutting out like as meant like you're cutting out the distribution middleman. You're cutting out the retail middleman. Um, so like, presumably you'd also want to cut out the banking middlemen if you could as well. Um, yeah. so yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess last question with, uh, with Shire. So if, if a local, you know, local farm wants to get on, how do they do that? And what's like, what's the criteria for being accepted? Yeah. So most of the farms that are on there, like me and a team of like volunteers, uh, or, or just people who know of a farm that they want to include, like you can upload it. If you make an account, you can just go make a new farm. Um, so it's pretty easy. Um, the, you know, it's, it's a very, like the product, like the app itself is like very like MVP stages. Like the ideal would be to have a sort of like community score that like validates whether or not a farm belongs on Shire based on, you know, our accepted criteria. But for the most part in a subjective way, like if the majority of their products like are legitimately organic, um, like no pesticides, no artificial fertilizers, no artificial pesticides. Mm -hmm. Um, and they use like proper methods and like raising their animals and like raising their plants. Um, then, then they're eligible for sure. Or if like a store, you know, sells like, 50% 50% of their food is like locally grown by such entities, then like that counts too. Awesome. Well, I have at least one outside of Pittsburgh that I can, uh, I can get nice. in there. So, nice. Uh, I'll, I'll check That'd that cool. out. But, uh, yeah. Hey man. So before we get to the bonus, uh, I want to give you time to plug, plug everything, plug your you know, social media, plug your sub stack, yeah. obviously where people can buy, uh, Moss of sure. Chips. Mosschips.com to buy Moss Chips. Uh, if you live in Southern California, you can also go to Airwan, but they're cheaper on Mosschips.com. Um, really tan man on every social media platform. My Substack, where I uh, provide all of my most in-depth discussions on these topics, um, is really tanman.substack.com. And uh, yeah, Shire, shireapp.io. And you can follow it on Shire underscore local on Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. Fantastic. Steve Arena, thank you for coming on the show, man. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. All right. All right. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Steven Arena. I hope it did not disappoint. Um, really interesting guy and uh, enjoyed getting to speak with him. Um, really I scheduled the interview after, so I, I bought Masa chips a, a while ago and I didn't realize that. So I, I, I followed uh, Steven's account on Twitter for a while, really tan man. And I didn't realize that he was the founder of Masa chips until I connected it together. I, uh, you know, had been really, you know, retweeting and enjoying a lot of his, uh, his, uh, threads on Twitter that he puts out there. And he did one recently on raw milk. And I read through that, loved it, which we talked about on the show, obviously. And that's when I connected together that he was he was the founder of this chip company. So I'm like, well, crap, I, I definitely got to talk to this dude. And uh, really glad I did. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, hopefully you go out and, and buy some Masa chips and support making this dream come true. Go to masachips.com slash lions or... You can just enter promo code LIONS at checkout for 10% off. And we get a little tiny kickback as well. But honestly, I really don't give a crap about that. I just want this to be successful because I think this is so important. I love tortilla chips. I love salsa. I love queso. Um, But the part that's terrible about it is all other tortilla chips, they are fried in seed oils or they're just tastes like garbage like these really healthy ones that are made with um you know mostly clean ingredients mostly taste like garbage these chips masa chips taste delicious guys they're fantastic so support the show and support a great company and go buy some masa tortilla chips and i'm going to leave with that i'm not going to plug anything else today i'm just going to say i will see you all next week i got another great guest lined up next week Um, We're going to stay down this road of talking about natural health, 
um, you know, alternative um, health, taking care of yourself in ways that, uh, you know, don't involve mainstream medicine. Uh, we'll, we'll put it that way. Got a great guest in that line and excited for you guys to hear that next week. And with that being said, hope you guys enjoy this episode and enjoy your week this week. Hopefully it's it's warming up uh, where you are. I know here in Western Pennsylvania, um, gonna have some warm weather this week, which is uh, which is nice. Um, getting up into the seventies, I believe. So hopefully, it's like that or better this week where you are. And I will talk to you all next week. Always remember to keep your head up, and the fires of liberty burning. <laughs>